So I want you guys to think about that. Autotrophs are self-producers that have the physical structures necessary to run photosynthesis. Heterotrophs cannot run photosynthesis. And the big reason is we don't have chloroplasts or chromoplasts. We actually use a little structure known as a mitochondria. But some organisms are mixotrophs. They can do both. They can run photosynthesis and they can eat things. Think about how that would change life if humans had the capability of being a mixotroph. A great, bright, beautiful, sunny day, you go outside and you absorb solar energy and you make oxygen and glucose for yourself and then you use that energy for your entire day's activities. Forget breakfast, forget the cup of coffee and forget the donuts and the bagels and everything we would need to eat for breakfast, we use sunlight. If it's not sunny out or later when the sun's gone down, your body is using the energy that you produce during the day to then function when you don't have sunlight. That could change so much about life, society, how much money would we save if we didn't have to go out and buy nearly as many groceries. So crazy idea, maybe, but who knows where humans will be in thousands or tens of thousands or millions of years. Will we be mixotrophs? Could we genetically engineer ourselves to have chloroplast? So may sound crazy, but who knows where we'll be. So, all right, well, let's take a look at how do we get to the point of photosynthesis if we are an autotroph? Well, here's a bean, a bean seed, simple little seed that's going to go through the process of growing and eventually running photosynthesis. But in order to do this, the first thing that happens is this process of germination. So every spring we see this in Illinois, farmers plant millions and millions and millions of seeds in the ground. Gardeners do the same thing. Heck, squirrels are doing it when they bury that acorn nut in the fall. And that seed sits and it waits. Temperature, moisture, water, and oxygen are the three things needed for germination. That bean seed, when it's buried underground, is going to go through aerobic respiration. It's gonna use this tiny little powerhouse structure called the mitochondria to produce energy, that ATP. So it takes all of that energy and uses it to grow. Now, it's using the starch that was stored in the bean seed or the barley seed or the corn seed or whatever the seed is. The starch is what's going to fuel or be the raw ingredient for aerobic respiration. And then as I mentioned, water, oxygen, that has to be there. The, the water triggers the seed to do this. It triggers the enzymes. But to run aerobic respiration, you need the starch that's actually been converted down to glucose and oxygen. Glucose and oxygen are the two things for aerobic respiration. And the mitochondria kicks into gear, producing ATP, energy. Let's make new cells. Let's make new cells. Let's make new cells. All this is happening underground for several days, weeks, until that part of the plant over here, this little part pushes its way up while the roots are growing down, pushes its way up, pops out of the soil, and then one of the first things it produces is a green leaf. That leaf unfolds and then it switches over to photosynthesis. So what we're seeing happen here is the seedling Oh. Seedlings 
seedling uses sugars for growth and what we're doing when we're talking about that malting process is the malting process stops the full germination. The malting process is working with this step, this step here to get the seed to start to break down the starches, produce the enzymes, but then we want to stop it before it makes this stem, roots, and eventually a leaf. We don't want that when we're making our beer. So it stops full germination, but the key here is it retains the enzymes. That's me bold that and underline that the malting process retains the enzymes produced by the seed by the embryo and it's the enzymes that are important for the rest of this pathway because the enzymes help break down the starches and convert the starches to the sugars we want before we feed it to the yeast. So again, remember with malting, this is all happening before the yeast are added. All right, so here's our malting process. So we're back to this. Just look at how do the enzymes work here. Okay, so to do that, to do that malting process. You know, we started with the barley. We got the barley to help provide us with the raw ingredients. And the primary thing that we want in the barley are the carbohydrates. So the barley is going to be filled with starches. So the barley contains starches, well, and the enzymes. This stuff's sitting inactive, kind of a dormant period, dormant state. The warm water triggers the enzymes to All right, so that warm water we put it in, so it's triggering the enzymes to break down the starches. The starches will break down, and the goal is to take the starch, bring it back to a disaccharide, to bring it back to a monosaccharide. Ideally, let's get it down to glucose. That's where we wanna be when we're moving through this pathway, this process. So what I want us to think about is the enzymes. How do they work? What's their job? And what happens if the enzymes don't work? Well, that's a huge problem. Oop, let me increase font size. Okay, so enzymes. Enzymes are protein based structures. And something I'm gonna put here, oh, I probably need a little. Protein-based structures. The shape equals the function of the enzyme. Okay, now when we look at enzymes, they speed up a chemical reaction. That's what they do, they just make it happen faster. The reaction's gonna happen but the enzyme makes it happen at a faster rate. So that's their job is to increase the rate. <clears throat> but if we change the shape, we denature an enzyme, often they don't function because shape equals function. So that's bad. If you change the shape of the enzyme and it denatures it, it doesn't work. Two factors that will change the shape of an enzyme 
The two factors that change the shape is if you go outside the range of temperature or the range of pH. All enzymes have an ideal range they want to work in, and if you move them out of it, it changes the shape. It's like melting a key or bending something. It doesn't work anymore. So we want to keep things in that ideal range. Now, some properties of enzymes that we want to be familiar with. are things like, they're very specific. So they're specific to a substrate or the ingredient in the pathway. So there's a specific enzyme in barley that works on starch. It won't work on anything else. It works just with starch. It's like a key and a lock. They fit together. So that's one feature that we want to remember. The enzymes, as I said before, will have an optimal range of temperature and pH. Uh oh, I'm going to run out of room. So let me do this. Another feature, they will simply increase the rate of the reaction, not a new reaction. So no new reactions here. So you're not creating something that, in a, that wouldn't happen naturally. You're just making it go faster. All right. And then the fourth key property is that enzymes are going to be reusable. So we can use them over and over and over, provided we didn't denature them. Let me spell that right. Sorry. Reusable. All right. So as long as we don't overcook or screw up the pH too much, that enzyme can keep working again and again and again and again for a long, 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 long time. So good to go, right? So let's make sure we don't denature our enzymes during any of this process. So those are the forms. What we want to think about with the starch is we're trying to break it down and get it down to glucose. Now, if we look at the seed, here's just a general picture of the seed. The endosperm is the thing that contains all the starch. Okay, so that's the part of the seed. When we eat a seed, that's what we're eating it for is to get that energy, that starch. The embryo is a living organism. This little guy here, right now it's in a dormant state. It's what will become the new plant. That is the structure that will produce the enzymes. The embryo has the ability to make enzymes once it's kind of woken up out of dormancy. And that's what the temperature and the moisture does is it says, hey, time to wake up. You can plant a seed when the soil temperature reaches an ideal number. It doesn't matter what the air temperature is. It's soil temperature that is critical. So in January, when it's 60 degrees out, we get those weird screwed up winters. I can't go and plant corn because the ground is still too cold. I have to wait for ground temperature to warm up and enough moisture to trigger this. All right, so that's what our general seed looks like. That's a corn seed, barley seed, very similar. Um, you know, same general idea. When we're looking at that so okay all right so malting what's going on with this malting stuff is what we want to talk about briefly here and take a look at you know, what are you doing with malting to get us to the point where we can use that product produced from malting to move to the next level so all right so i'll get into that in the next part of the lecture